I pray that I may speak to you this day in the name of God, holy and blessed Trinity. It is a joy to be here with you again, this beautiful community. And I bring greetings from the beautiful community in which I serve, the Order of St. Anne and our chapel in Arlington Heights, where I worship this morning at 7.30 a.m. <laughs> they like to get up early. <laughs> if you haven't been, I invite you to come and visit us. The sisters hold you daily in their prayers and would love to show you around their beautiful space and their beautiful gardens. The gardens there are a tremendous resource for healing, for contemplation, for finding a place to tuck in with all those things our hearts hold. A few years ago, around the time that COVID came, the decision was made to take down what had been the dining hall when there was the St. Anne's School for Girls. It was an old building and it was getting hard to keep up and they weren't sure what they wanted to do with that space anyway, but we did need a small parking lot so that we didn't have to register everybody who comes to stay overnight who parks on the street in Arlington. I don't know if that's a thing in Boston, but <laughs> yes, okay. We also then um, decided to create a new garden. So we call it our baby garden and it is the mysteries of joy the Mysteries of Joy garden that's just beginning to take shape. The Mysteries of Joy are those five mysteries that span the place between the Annunciation and Jesus teaching in the temple when he got lost from his parents. So those stories around the nativity. The Mysteries of Joy, which we have just so recently celebrated, are marked by a lot of angels. Angels showing up to speak with Mary, to speak with Joseph, angels singing to the shepherds and singing Gloria. And in this context, in the Mysteries of Joy, the angels consistently say that phrase that we also know by heart. Don't be afraid, right? Don't be afraid, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. We can kind of go through in all of the different Gospels, and there they are in their glory and their wonder and their majesty, and kind of the terrifying aspect of them as well, saying, don't be afraid. But I think it's so interesting to note that in our Lenten stories and Holy Week stories, the angels are still there, but they don't say anything. Jesus is in the wilderness and tempted and starving and the angels come and minister to him. Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives to pray the Garden of Gethsemane and asks that things might go a different way, but says, whatever it is your will is, I will do that. And the angels come and minister to him. And the angels don't say anything until guess when? Easter, when the stone is rolled away. And you know what they say? Don't be afraid. So I've been pondering this and thinking, what does this mean? Like, what is that truth that's hidden in there for us around these mysteries? So I was walking in the gardens. And so the Mysteries of Joy Garden that I described for you, if you stand at the back of the chapel and you look, it goes down this way. And so we are in the process of putting up signage to help people find their way between the mysteries, the Annunciation, to the Visitation, to the Nativity, to the dedication of Jesus in the temple, to Jesus teaching in the temple. And as I was walking along trying to figure out where these signs might go, I noticed that the the suffering stories, the sorrowful mysteries, are right up against the mysteries of joy. And you can even stand with one foot in one garden and one foot in the other garden, 
moving from the mysteries of joy straight into the stations of the cross, which is how Lent feels a lot. We just jump right from one to the other. But the truth of our faith is that we are often jumping back and forth, sometimes even in the same conversation with those we encounter and those that we love. Hearing from them the sorrows, the crosses, the burdens that they carry and weigh them down. But then also mingled in there the levity of the joy and the compassion encountered along the way. At the convent, the sisters have a very precise way of moving about their day, shaping it with prayer and thanksgiving and listening, and making sure that nothing goes to waste. So they receive many, 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 many Christmas cards, lots of Christmas cards, and they're all out in the common area, and they enjoy looking at them. And then year by year, they take those Christmas cards and they take the paper cutter and they cut them into bookmarks. So if you come to worship with us, you will maybe find these bits of Christmas cards tucked into the prayer books and into the hymnal. One night at evening prayers, I was contemplating this bit about the angels in the nativity stories being kind of loud and rambunctious and having a lot to say and a lot to sing and being quieter in Lent. And I turned to my page in the, the prayer book, and there was just a bit of an angel, just the wings. And I thought, oh, hello. <laughs> Have you come to minister to me? We'll say evening prayer together. And then when I turned to the next part, the Magnificat, there was a halo and a bit of a trumpet. I thought, oh, more to come in this story. We think about those angels who tuck in beside us in the midst of our making our way through our daily journeys. And the truth is, that most often, when we are in those difficult places, we, like Jesus, welcome the quietness of the angels. Those who can sit right there and absorb some of the sorrow that we're carrying. Take a bit of that grief on our behalf. And somehow, in doing that, Offer us the delight of comfort. And the other wonder in that is that we, in all that we encompass, the myriad emotions and shames and vulnerabilities, are also able to offer that to one another. And we don't have to be loud or bombastic or eloquent, just present, just showing up. In our first reading from Genesis, as Abram in his old age is perhaps wondering what things are going to be like and how things are going to unfold, is told that he still has it in him to have many ancestors that will come after him. That his story isn't finished and his wife's story isn't finished either. And that not only will they have ancestors yet to come, but they will be like the stars in the sky. Now, I do think it's a little frustrating and interesting that in Romans, Paul says, Abraham understood always and every time that God was with him, and he never stumbled, and, he, and that's not true. Because <laughs> we've read, we read Genesis. We know he stumbles, and we know he makes some mistakes, and, you know, things have to be worked out as they do. So we don't know what was going on with Paul on that particular day, but we hope an angel came along beside him and offered him something. It's okay. 
settle that. In our gospel reading from Mark, Jesus and the disciples are trying to make sense of complicated things. And in the midst of that, the crowds keep coming. So Jesus is trying to teach the disciples and teach the crowds and also quiet his own heart in the midst of all of that. And today's reading comes right after Jesus has been saying, who are people saying that I am? It's a question of that identity, right? Do, who do you understand me to be? What core of truth do you see in me? And Peter has said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And he knows he's got it right, right? Think of those times in our lives when we get it so right. And we love to stand in that place and think, yes, let me just stay here. <laughs> and then Jesus goes on to say, and not only that, because of that, because of that truth, these painful things are going to unfold. And we will be in it together. And how he will go to Jerusalem, and he will suffer, and he will die. And then he just, at the very end, tacks on that little bit. And then I will rise again. But they don't hear that part, right? All they've heard is the suffering the agony and the pain and Peter says no don't say that let's figure out a different plan I do not like this plan we know this story with the people that we love and sometimes in our own lives and the stories we tell and people don't want to hear those difficult truths and yet we have to find ways to speak them to articulate and to ask questions and to trust that the angels are going to continue to tuck in alongside and offer us wisdom and grace and mercy and truth. And at the very end of our gospel reading today, when the Son of God returns and the angels with him. We want to be in that circle. Counted as righteous. Counted as those who have done that wrestling with vulnerability, with our humility, and with that grace and greatness that God has placed in us. So as we continue to wander between these gardens of glory and grace, of mysteries, mysteries of joy and mysteries of sorrow, may God send us glimpses of angels to sit with us, to hold our hands, and to remind us that we are beloved. Amen.